This is an Ion Annapolis bonus podcast. Well, on a snowy morning, we're invited out to Davidsonville, sitting in the living room of uh, Dr. Bruce Fleming. How are you today? I'm great. Like in the right doc- You're a doctor. You're a PhD. I am. I got my PhD from Vanderbilt in 1982. I was 27. Well, you are a professor of English at the United States Naval Academy. Uh, you are an author of six or seven books now at this point. Well, it's actually more than 20. That's just in the last three years, the six or seven <laughs> books. So, yeah. And... I don't know whether it's fair to say that you're on a sabbatical from the Naval Academy. Would that be a... <laughs> well, it's kind of a forced sabbatical, but by golly, I'm, I'm using it for... Uh, I'm using it as a sabbatical. I, I've uh, written and gotten in the publishing process six books, scholarly books, with the Anglo-American publishing house Routledge. Google my name, Google Routledge, and you'll, you'll get them all. Number five has just appeared, I think, uh, and number six is still in the pipeline. So, uh, yeah, I'm on a forced sabbatical, but as I say, I'm enjoying every minute of it. It's at taxpayer expense, so thank you very much, taxpayers in the United States of America. (laughs) Well, the book that you've just released is called Saving Our Service Academies, My Battle With and For the United States Naval Academy to Make Thinking Officers. And you're very critical of the service academies, as well as the Naval Academy. And that's not something that's absolutely foreign to you because you've been vocal for many years. And I think um, anybody that follows the Naval Academy news here in Annapolis probably has seen your name uh, in an op-ed in the Capitol at one point or another. And uh, some might say, oh, he's a professional nudge, which I don't know is a bad word to, to say for that. But throughout your career at the Naval Academy, when you saw the red flags... You waved them. I mean, you were like pointing them out. And it's, at least from my point of view, it seems like that nobody wanted to listen. So now we're here and you've got a book. That's absolutely right. Uh, the administration specifically doesn't want to listen. Annapolis doesn't want to listen, for that matter. I mean, they've got a they've got a mili- what I call a military Disneyland in in our backyard because I live here too, and it's Annapolitans that are mo- the most outraged when that Professor Fleming um, uh, mouths off again. Uh, that and the parents of the kids there. But uh, the reason that the parents are, are are typically upset, of course, is that their kid is getting a free college education. In fact, it's paid. At taxpayer expense, compare that to what even the University of Maryland costs, you know, far far less what private schools cost. They're getting free education, cost the taxpayers about half a million dollars to produce one officer, and then they're guaranteed employment for at least five years after that at some of the highest rates of any college graduate. So, you know, the parents just want me to shut up, we'll roll over and die. And a lot of Annapolitans typically do as well. Um, the, The Annapolis Capitol in the old days did a lot of investigation reporting. Uh, There's a guy named Earl Kelly, who sadly is now dead, and he did just bombshell stories. One was on drug use at the Naval Academy. One was on the cheating scandals, on the the fact that in order to kind of sweeten the pot for female midshipmen, they were just, as he put it, justice was tilted towards women and so on. So why do I wave a red flag? First of all, that's my responsibility as a professor. Professors are supposed to write And it's also my responsibility as a taxpayer. I mean, the people in Annapolis get far more benefit out of the Naval Academy than especially the ones, the local kids with the the, the parents are just cleaning up. So it's my responsibility as as a taxpayer to ask the question, the difficult questions, which are, it's a government program, right? So the joke about government programs is that you can't kill them. And I think that's true of the service academies. We set them up when they made sense, but they no longer make sense. So there's all that. Uh, I was on the admissions board in about 2005 and saw things that I thought were clearly illegal. So I started writing about that. Uh, that was wave one. Wave two was the sexual assault I won't say nonsense because it was pretty lethal, of the Obama administration where Title IX, which most people associate with sports for girls, was used to presuppose that in any case where a man and a woman typically, they also worked for same sex, but it was always used for men, male, female, where the woman decides maybe weeks, maybe even months after what the guy might may well have thought was a consensual sexual encounter that, no, she wasn't really that into it. She was encouraged, encouraged 
mind you, to report that as sexual assault because Congress, this is in civilian schools as well, of course, but it was even worse at the Naval Academy because Congress had put the screws on the service academies. They require an annual report on sexual assault reports at the service academy. So that was round two. And the most recent round is this so-called DEI stuff, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But you got to understand that's, you know, people choose the names of their movements for a reason and they choose the nicest sounding label to put on it. So diversity sounds great, equity sounds great, and inclusion sounds great. But in fact, what it means is because this is a zero sum game in admissions to begin with, we can only take a certain number of, of people. Parenthetically, I'll say they lie about the number of applications they get. It's, that's another thing that just drove me wild, and I, I can explain that in a minute. But not just admissions, but the faculty hiring. And now the pressure is on to get faculty members who are something other than, you know, the boring straight white males of the past, which is great, except that it means that our curriculum and our faculty are now being tilted in a specific direction, specifically for that direction. So the military is easy to control because it's controlled by much easier than even civilian colleges because it can be controlled by the military brass with the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So we've had all these waves of uh, what we used to call political correctness and what's now typically called woke uh, ideology. I'm not crazy about the term. I don't think that the people who use it know what it is, but it's all these get groups in that are have not been represented. All these things have been imposed with a much greater force. I mean, the students, to, to be clear, midshipmen and of course at West Point cadets, and basically what I'm saying of, of Annapolis is also true of all the other service academies, West Point in particular. Uh, I would invite listeners to check out a book by a colleague of mine at West Point. His name is Tim Backen, B-A-K-K-E-N, and he wrote a book maybe two years ago called The Cost of Loyalty, and it's all about the dishonesty, and he, he, I think the, the subtitle is something like Dishonesty, Hubris, and Something at West Point. Uh, he quotes me a lot, so it's kind of <laughs> flattering, but anyway, I'm not the only person ringing the the bells here. So they're not what people think they are is the bottom line. Let me just get kind of basic and interrupt me at any point. But the basic facts about the naval the service academies are that once upon a time they produced pretty close to 100% of new officers, not 100% because we've had some form of ROTC reserve officer training corps since forever. Uh, forever. But it got a huge shot in the arm after the Second World War and then another shot in the arm in the 60s. So the result is that, just to stick with Annapolis, but West Point is the same, Annapolis produces fewer than one in five new Navy and Marine Corps officers because, of course, a lot of people don't know that the Marine Corps is a subset of uh, the Department of the Navy. So we also, about a quarter of our kids go into the Marine Corps. So one in five. So where do the other, actually it's even less than that, it's eight, about 18% now. So where do the other 82% come from? The answer is that they come from this beefed up ROTC stuff. And basically any college you've heard of, except for small liberal arts colleges, has ROTC. University of Maryland has ROTC. Hopkins has ROTC. Both my sons go to out-of-state private schools that have ROTC. Any land-grant educational institution, any land-grant university will have ROTC and a lot of the private ones as well. All the three, everybody uh, saw, maybe, saw the uh, interrogation of the presidents of the University of Pennsylvania, MIT, and Harvard. All those schools have got ROTC. Harvard, I think, has to send them to MIT. But they all have the option. So everybody has ROTC. So point number one is we don't numerically speaking need the service academies because we could just beef up ROTC even more. Here's the, the, the bottom line. There is absolutely no evidence that the products that come from the service academies are any better or stay in any longer than the ones who come from ROTC. And I would argue, based on my 36 years there, that they're in some sense worse because I've never seen a graduating firsty, we call them, who's in, as enthusiastic about military service as he or she was 
when that person came in as a plebe. It's just four years of grinding down. The courses they take are identical to the courses that they would take at a civilian school. There are a couple of kind of military specific things. They all have to take naval history, but okay, great. But what about the other 82% of the ROTC people and OCS is the other one, Officer Candidate School? They all go to a, a kind of a finishing school when they graduate and are, and are commissioned. If you if you really need a naval history course, you can teach it then. So there's no there's there's absolutely no reason to have the service academies. They cost about half a million dollars per kid. The service academies altogether are about two point four billion dollars a year, which is admittedly less than an aircraft carrier, but an aircraft carrier stays around. It's about a third of an aircraft carrier, in fact. (laughs) But aircraft carriers stay around for longer than a year. And every year, this is taxpayer money being pumped into these places. So uh, they cost about four times what an ROTC scholarship officer costs and about eight times what an OCS officer candidate school officer costs. So they're expensive. They produce a, a handful of officers and they demoralize the students. And now on top of that, those are the three things that if you, of course, I encourage everybody listening to buy my book, which is beneficial to me, but I think it would also be beneficial to Annapolis to know what actually goes on here. The fourth thing, those are the three things that the Department of Defense already knows. They've been trying, if you, I forget which chapter of the book it is, where I go through repeated attempts by the DOD, Department of Defense, to figure figure out what is going on at the service academies, and they just can't do it. They admit defeat over and over and over. So, you know, people ought to know what actually goes on there. It's not at all what you, speaking to Annapolitans, it's not at all what you think it is. Well, it's behind the walls. I mean, you've got physical walls that are there, and I mean, there's plenty that can go on there. And I know there's one, uh, and I, I don't believe they enforce it at this point, but at one point for media... Uh, regardless of whether you were just strolling to look at the flowers on, you know, Stribling or whether you were just showing somebody the academy, you needed to register and have an escort with you because, gosh forbid, you would see something that you would write about that you didn't have somebody where that message was controlled. Nor, nor can outsiders speak directly to the midshipmen. I mean, you can say, hello, how are you? And tourists love, of course, tourists love uh, the Naval Academy. It's not just Annapolis, but because Annapolis goes to the football games, Annapolis goes to the parades and so on. But we're a tourist spot because we're, we're less than 45 minutes from Washington. So people come to Washington and then Annapolis is typically an add-on. I mean, everybody loves Loves Annapolis. I love Annapolis. It's a you know beautiful small town, small city. And then we've got the Naval Academy. West Point, for by contrast, is you know an hour north of New York City, and it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's a pretty location if you've been up there. It's right on the Hudson. I mean, my personal taste is not for. I think it's but but ugly. I mean, to be perfectly frank, it's, it's got it's it's got these you know huge castle like buildings and so on. It's not our pretty. Turn of the century, Ernest Flagg was the name of the architect who did most of our pretty buildings. And they're beautiful. They're French Beaux Arts. It's, you know, we're a national historic land, landmark or whatever the term is. But yes, it's tightly controlled. The tourists come on, and if you say to a midshipman, Incidentally, some people think that, listen to the term midship man, they think that there ought to be a female version of that, but there's not. There's no such thing as a midship woman. Right. They're all midshipmen. And I'll also explain for maybe listeners don't know where that term comes from. At West Point and Air Force, they're called cadets. Air Force split off from the Army in the 19, after World War II, and Air Force Academies comes from the 1950s. So they're all cadets. They're called midshipmen because the Naval Academy was founded in 1845 when it became clear that the system that that produced young officers was no longer adequate. And that system was, of course, these were sailing ships. You've all seen the pictures or been on them, maybe. And the young young boys, they were all male, 13, 14, would go on as mid, midshipmen. And what they were called midshipmen because they were the ones that shimmied up the rigging amidships. So we've uh, retained that terminology. So if you go on as a, as a tourist and start talking to a midshipman, how you doing? Doing well, sir. Doing well, ma'am. Everybody loves the sir and the ma'am stuff. Feels like a throwback to a th- an earlier era. But then you can't ask them anything more. There, it's it's your point that they're instructed to. Uh, if you try to get into a real conversation, well, hey, how do you like it here? They're instructed to refer you to the public affairs officer. So we have extremely tight grasp on 
anything leaking out. And then there's Fleming. And Fleming is writing these things that people get outraged because I, I want to say, hey, I'm trying to protect your money. This is this is a government program. I mean, don't you want to know what actually goes on? No, they don't because it shatters their illusions. I mean, it's a it's a nice illusion. It's a beautiful place. And I'm the only one doing it. So, you know, it's it, you, you are you are a lone voice that's been out there. And for those that are listening, I mean, you were essentially fired from the Naval Academy from a tenured position. Correct. There's a, an asterisk on that because it turns out that we're not actually tenured. They tell us we're tenured. But yes, I was fired in, in 2018. And that was appealed and that was reinstated. Absolutely. They and lost. The Naval Academy cooked up this thing. I can go into chapter and verse on what they did. Incidentally, this was only the culmination of more than 15 years of punishments. So they finally just said, let's throw a Hail, Hail Mary pass and, and fire this guy. And they had no basis. And they when it went to court, the judge flatlined every single one of their ridiculous assertions. And again, it's kind of mordantly funny for me what they came up with because it was just so stupid. I, I mean, but yes, I was fired and I was retroactively reinstated. And uh, as a result of this hearing, one day before my 60, 65th birthday, incidentally, it was a nice birthday present. But the reason that I'm on eternal sabbatical is that the dean, who now, thank goodness, is gone, he was my mortal enemy and he decided he was <laughs> going to take down Bruce Fleming. And he invoked a clause that, of course, I'm a federal employee, so what applies to me is as a federal employee, not as a professor at the Naval Academy. So there is a, a clause in all this federal stuff. This was a federal court, a federal judge, blah, 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 for federal employees, I mean, that says that if the, okay, fine, they lost, they have to pay me, but they don't have to let me work. That's the asterisk. If the, the magic word is distraction, if having the, the person who's just won his case come back to work would be a, quote, distraction, then they don't have to let that person, that's me, come back to work. So uh, he invoked that. I think he just, you know, was so furious that, that he'd lost. And of course, this is with the full support of, you know, countless superintendents, like the superintendent who just got out, name was Buck, bragged that he had, he, uh, he he said in an open forum, you know, Professor Bruce Fleming was never going to teach at the Naval Academy while he was superintendent. His predecessor, whose name is Carter, who I just read, has become the president of Ohio State University, which makes my eyes go in opposite directions in my head. <laughs> he bragged also in an open forum that he had fired Bruce Fleming. So, I mean, they have no sense of we're supposed to be tenured. Right. And that's supposed to protect me to tell the truth. But not at the Naval Academy. It turns out we don't actually have academic tenure. Uh, all we have is this protection of the, the federal system, which worked to my advantage. So I honestly didn't think I was undergoing any risk. I mean, okay, they came up with their punishments. It started, there was a superintendent named Rodney Rempt, who was something of a clown case. He wanted the midshipmen to sing at parades. Some of the listeners may remember that. Uh, he was into the sailing team, which is fine. Anyway, so I wrote my first article about what I'd seen on the admissions board. And he his response was this furious two-page letter alleging that it wasn't professional for a professor to write an article. So I thought it was ridiculous. And I immediately went to the Washington Post. I went to, to CNN. There's a, there's a CNN segment on it, which is in the back of my book. There are all these things. Have, uh, there's an extensive list of uh, articles to, if, you, if you're interested in following them up and, and that thing. So I thought that was the end of it. But no, they over the next 15 years, they upped the ante. They increased the volume. I got two official letters of reprimand for things they didn't like that I said in class. Specifically, I mean, that was laughable. That one was round two. Round one was the affirmative action, which was clearly illegal. The Supreme Court has decided that uh, in saying that an affirmative action is illegal in civilian universities, they've made, maybe listeners are aware, they've made an exception for the service academy. So the service academies can continue to let in based on race. And let me let me just put on the table that I came to Annapolis in, as I say, in 1987, after teaching from, well, I got my PhD in 1982. So I was a Fulbright scholar in West Germany. I speak in West Berlin, actually. I speak German and French and three other languages. 
followed by teaching for two years in, in West Germany, followed by two years teaching at the National University of Rwanda in Central Africa. And of course, in Rwanda, everybody's black. The, the president's black, the prisoners are black, the Supreme Court justices are black, shopkeepers are black. Black is great. What's not great is what I found on the admissions board, where if you check a box that say you're, it's not just African American, now we've added Asians. So we have these recent Chinese immigrants who are given preferential treatment at the service academies at Annapolis. And one of those came back to haunt me incidentally in this, in this, uh, the thing that got me fired. I'll tell that story in a minute if we have time. But what I found on the admissions board was that we, we lower the standards drastically in order to get people of certain races, not white. Okay. The justification given for that during the oral arguments uh, in the Supreme Court case where the government argued that we had problems in Vietnam because there were a lot of black and Hispanic enlisted and not so many officers. So uh, the response to that is this ain't Vietnam. And what it does, it, it, it creates a, a racially charged atmosphere at, at Annapolis. So we have problems with the fact that it's, it's a racist. Okay. It's a, it's a racist football school. I'll get to football, but it's racially charged in the sense that the white kids begin to realize that the black kids, there are stellar African American students. I've had the privilege of teaching a number of them. I don't know why they, you know, it's got to be duty on our country down the, down the line. Why otherwise would they come to a service academy where they have to wear uncomfortable clothing and get up at ODAR 100 for inspections and so on when any gifted kids of this caliber can get a scholarship to anywhere and yet they chose to come to so my hat's off to them i and i have taught a number of them but the fact is the bar is low it's lower for non-white applicants that doesn't mean that you see the converse i'm dealing with it doesn't mean that all non-white applicants could not have cleared a much higher bar. It just means that the bar they have to clear is lower. And nowadays, that's for women. It's for non-white people. So we're all about social engineering. People sometimes say, I've been on radio shows recently where, where the, the commentator will say, you know, well, isn't this producing the warrior class of our, of our uh, officer corps? No, no. First of all, they're only one in five, as I say, and that's not what we're about. They're not more hardened. They're not more warrior-like. They're not more anything. What they are is, is uh, I say, they're the vanity projects of the military brass. Well, you know, you talk about the even one in five and the twenty percent that are coming out of the. Well, it's actually eighteen, but I eighteen out, out of the service academies. Yeah. Do you know how many continue on in a career in the military? I mean, I've got to think that the intent of the Naval Academy or any of the service academies when they were first established was not just to get people in and educate them in five and done. I don't think that's. I mean, that that's the minimum requirement. Do you know what the statistic is for folks that come through the academies that? make a career out of that as opposed to the five and done. Yes. I've been after this one for a number of years and I, I don't have a bottom line, bottom line, but I have a pretty good idea. The answer, because they don't like to publish these. And, and, and the reason they don't like to publish these is that it's actually in our mission statement. You know, it says to, to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically, ha, to all three, and to prepare them for a career of service in blah, 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 in the Navy or Marine Corps, a career. About the answer your question uh, is that about half of them leave they they do they call it five and dive about half of the class leaves after five years so the number of them that make it to what the military call a career which is 20 years so it spits them out in their when they're early to mid 40s is very small indeed so uh, no they don't they don't stay on for 20 years even if you define 20 years as a career uh, which is a little strange these days. People live longer and it's not dangerous. We, the Navy guys don't. Marine guys, you know, may they rest in peace, die. Navy guys and gals don't die. And there were In Iraq and Afghanistan, we lost something like 7,000 service members, of which 224 were Navy. Navy is basically in its ships. I'm not talking about the SEALs here. I mean, those guys, you know, my hat's off to those. And we just lost a guy. It's in the newspapers. I mean, that just makes my heart shrivel because I teach these guys. 
and they're the, they're the highest performers. So no, they don't stay in it. That's my earlier point. There's nothing to justify the cost or the the annoyance to the kids. Uh, they don't stay in. They they get out when their commitment is up. Um, they don't stay in longer, and they're not better. What's your solution? I mean, you you've seen this, and and I will say that I mean I've seen the documentation of some of your classroom antics, for lack of a better word. And I mean, I mean, there's been accusations that have been falsely about, you know, what, when you put your hand on somebody's shoulder and there, there was. I'll be happy to address those. Um, those no, I'm, those I'm, were there. It's not. No, I'd like to address those. Those those were the cooked up accusations. They found a kid. I had him as a plebe and he was all, you know, Professor Fleming, this, then Professor, he sent me an email saying how he wanted me to, uh, he wanted to have me second semester. And then he went home and talked to mom and dad and mom and dad didn't like what Professor Fleming was, was explaining in the classroom among, among them, what, uh, what we used to call sex, sex change operation was gender reassignment surgery, gender affirmation surgery. We even hear. So the question is, well, what, what's an English professor doing explaining a sex change operation? And the answer is easy. This was the time of President Trump who was saying, we're not going to pay, pay for transgender. In the, once again, it's permitted, but then it wasn't. And the students said, one midshipman, not this kid, said, sir, what's a, what's a sex change operation? I said, seriously, you don't know? So I explained. I mean, I grew up with someone who years ago had a sex change operation. So it's not a walk in the park. I mean, it's 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 gruesome surgery. So I explained. And he this kid, he went home and he explained to his parents what I had talked about in class uh, before getting back to the short story. I mean, it was related to the short story in some way. I can't even remember what. And the parents were outraged. So he wrote a 16 page rant. Uh, making all these crazy allegations. But then in the hearing, this is not the last thing you were talking about, but I'll get there. In the hearing, the judge figured out, and this is all public, matter of public record, that he, this kid wanted an A in the class and thought he deserved an A because he'd gotten an A in his high school class back down in Florida. <laughs> and he was furious that he didn't get an A from Professor Fleming. So this was his revenge tour, all right? And so they cobbled together a bunch of stuff uh, in order to give him some cover. Yeah, there was a kid. I make the students give the presentations because they have to learn how to stand on their own two feet and control the room. So that means that I'm, they sit typically in a circle. It's not rows in, in most of our classrooms. They sit in a circle. So midshipmen are kind of sweet. They always go to the same desk. So it's always the same configuration. So there was this one empty desk that nobody ever sat in. So I would have the student give the presentation and that meant that I had to go sit in the circle. So I would sit in this empty seat seat and was always next to the same guy and I think the allegation was that twice I patted this guy on the back and to me that's perfectly natural I'm a big loud superior male and he might be scared you know here's the professor sitting next to him so you know it's a reassuring pat and so they got him into the court and the judge said, this is the allegation. I mean, the Naval Academy is a stinker. It's just a, a friggin' stinker that they came up with this. It sounds like me too, you know, unwanted touching, unwanted touching. So <laughs> he gets this uh, kid sitting there and his, they all look great. They were in their, their whites. It was summer. And the judge says to him, Professor Fleming patted you on the back. Did that bother you? And the, and the kid says, no. End of story. End of story. <laughs> and yet the administration went with that as, in other words, they had nothing. They were sucking air on this, but they clearly didn't think I would. Uh, oh, and then there was the, I have to tell you this. I know you want to move on, but there was, the, then there was the Chinese kid. This is what I'm talking about. There was a Chinese kid that it, I, I say Chinese because recent immigrant. Re, they're all citizens. So, you know, some of them get their citizenship papers, you know, the day of I day. It's that recent. And a lot of them have language problems. That's another another story entirely that I won't get into uh, where they tried to mount an investigation because of something I'm supposed to have said to an to a, actually a Korean kid. Limited language ability in English that I was trying to help in EI in my EI is, is extra instruction. It's called where they come in for tutoring. That's another whole story. They mounted this this investigation that they finally had to walk away from because uh, because they did. Um, 
But anyway, this Chinese kid sat there in the hearing and alleged that I had purposely mispronounced his last name and his family honor was in the name back in China. So the judge kind of looked at him and, you know, how do you, uh, of course, I didn't purposely miss, I didn't even remember this kid. I mean, he was that colorless. And I've had a lot of Asian students who are not colorless, by the way. So it's, it's not an Asian thing. That's, so it's, it's crazy what they came up with. I mean, it was just zero, 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 zero. And that's why they lost. Well, I, you know, I, I've seen some of the stories and everything else. And, and if I look back at my own college career, the professors that are not up at the lectern lecturing were the most memorable ones. The ones that had the stories, the ones that were flamboyant, the ones that were, you know, made you excited about learning are the ones that had the most impact certainly on me. And I think I can't imagine that it's any different in that in a service academy. You know, as I look at these things, I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense in that we're just not graduating or commissioning the leaders that we were back in the 1900s or in the 1800s because that bar has been lowered so much. What is the solution to this? I mean, we've got a new superintendent. She just came aboard uh, last week. Is there hope for the academies? Okay, I, I obviously I want to answer that question, but let me just snag back to the beginning of what you were talking about. I realized early on that I had to put on a show to keep them awake. I mean, what people don't understand, one of the 5,000 things people don't know about the service academies, or Annapolis in particular, is that they're all sleep deprived. And that's, you know, for the plebes, they, we, the joke is that that's on purpose so that they don't ask questions about why they have to do all these crazy things. <laughs> but they're sleep deprived. And if you leave them alone in a classroom, they will fall asleep. I mean, you can look, there. I have unfortunately colleagues who are not as proactive as I am and who are not as loud and who are not as big and who aren't willing to put on a show for the students and they just sit there and the students just nod off. I mean, it's a, it's a common problem at, at the Naval Academy. Plus, they don't even really want to be in an English class. They don't know why they should be taking English. I can tell you why. It's not just where to put the commas and it's much more basic than that. It's how to process data. I mean, you can take a poem and they're supposed to read it three times. They prepare it for class. So they come into class and I say, what's going on here? And they'll come up with the craziest stuff. It's just what they want to, want to see. It's not what's actually there. So the exercise is making them actually look at the data. Now, why is that important in battle? It's important in battle because if you're just going with what you want to be true, you're going to lose and you're going to kill your people. So you actually have to pay attention to what's going on. You don't walk in with your presuppositions. So it's a, a set of of directly translatable skills to being officers. That's the subtitle to my book, to make thinking officers. So I need to underline just how, how important these skills are. They don't even know they, they're supposed to be in an English class and they don't know why. So I have to put on the show in order to, you know, I, I sell the material with my personality. They wouldn't take it on board if I just tried to give, give them the material. It's a hard, I, I joke and I say it's the hardest audience in a world, in the world. It's, you know, 18 to 21 worked out bored, sleep-deprived kids. So my show, I, I think I can say, was pretty darn good in its day. I mean, I'm famous for doing one-arm push-ups for them. You know, they're trying to fall asleep as a class because they've gotten up at ODARC 100 for an inspection. So I get up and we do, you know, we do jumping jacks. We do push-ups. We have push-up contests that I participate in. We do sit-up contests that I participate in. So it keeps them aware. So, yeah. Absolutely. You got to put on a show. Otherwise, they're not going to pay a bit of attention. And yes, I have colleagues who are not putting on the show and they don't get much results. Everybody knows that the Naval Academy is a mind, what the students call a mind dump institution where you memorize it for the test and then you forget it. And, and your colleagues that aren't getting the results there, I mean, they're rewarded, if you will. I yeah. mean, they're not... Not, right. Certainly not punished. They're not punished. No, they climb the ladder and they retire and the kids don't remember them. And I, I'm proud to say, you know, that, that I have a lot of former students that I'm still in touch with. Um, so the class of 1990, for example, produced a bunch of those guys. I taught the honor seminar. And one of those guys is Fred Kacher, who's just stopped being the interim superintendent. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you what, how to fix it. But let, let me make clear what, what the skill set is here that I'm, you have to, 
they go on about this is a leadership laboratory. That's total BS. They don't teach leadership. They have a department of leadership. The students joke and call it leader less. It's, it's multiple guests. You don't teach leadership in a classroom. You model it. You model it. And leadership part, you know, please buy my book. I like it. I think you might like it, listeners. But there's a whole chapter on what the nature of leadership is. It's about paying attention to your people. It's about showing them respect. All those good things. So all these things are are directly, it's not just teaching English. I realized early on that I couldn't just be an English professor like an English professor. I had to be an English professor at the U.S. Naval Academy, and that's what I tried to do. So what are we going to do about it? I can solve about 40% of the problems from one day to the next. The rest of the problems are more deep-seated. I'll come back to the 40%. What I really suggest, and again, this is it, this is in my book, is that we do with the service academies, which once again, they have no right to life. They're government programs. The world has changed. They've changed. They don't serve the same function they served. So they're, they're all put in Texas terms. They're all hat and no cattle. They're all about show, not better quality, bums the students out, and so on and so forth. So what are we going to do? What I suggest suggest is that we do with the service academies what the British did with their service academy, Sandhurst, which used to have an undergraduate education component. We need to get out of the undergraduate education business. I mean, it's four years in a boarding school where they live on top of each other. They're not allowed to even hold hands, no, and much less have sex. Now that's about 40% girls. Uh, gays are, are now tolerated. When I first came in, they were being thrown out. Then we had a kind of an interim period of so-called don't ask, don't tell, which is now over as well. So transgender is okay. So we've got the usual mix, and yet they're not even supposed to be holding hands, much less having sex. So it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So we have to get out of the undergrad. And they're 18 to 21 or 22, 23, at the, 23, 24 at the max. You can't be older than 23 on what's called I-Day, induction day. So if you've been in the Marine Corps, for example, you can, if you're 22 and counting, you can Come still. Come back as a prior enlisted. Yeah, the prior enlisted. We have about 5% prior enlisted. So you can, but you can't be older than about 27 when you graduate. So if we get out of the undergraduate education business, which as I say, we don't do any better, in fact, worse. Uh, I mean, look at what they did to a tenured, ostensibly tenured professor. That would be me. No academic freedom and so on. Have to toe the party line. That's not education. So stop pretending. Just get out of the business. So the, the Brits did. They just said, OK, go to both of the princes, the Prince of Wales, for example, but, you know, and his brother, the hapless Harry. Uh, all went to, I think it was in Scotland, that you just go to a civilian university, and then you go to Sandhurst for eight-month course, nine-month course. It kind of militarizes you. It fills in whatever blanks. Maybe that's where you want to have your naval, naval history course. It's not the Naval War College, which is, you know, writing learned dissertations on Napoleonic campaigns or something. Use the buildings. I mean, Annapolis wouldn't be affected. No, there wouldn't be parades. No, there wouldn't be football games. And that's another another. Thing that irks me. We should not, we let in kids that are, are, I mean, we do have, once again, there are exceptions to everything. I've taught some really smart football players, but I've also taught a lot of not really smart football players, and they can never take on what I say because I'm always right, and I always, you know, I justify what I say, and I give the sources and so on. So what they take on is the fact that I'm saying it. They don't like it. And the pushback when I say, what are we doing with a recruited football team of, you know, big, usually not that bright guys? Some of them are very sweet. I've had them as students. I love them as human beings. But, you know, if we're supposed to be the best and the brightest, and they're told that multiple times every week, drives me crazy. What are we doing with a recruited football team? Because a Division I recruited football team that's not even doing very well these days. For a while, they, they did pretty well. But, you know, the Navy doesn't play football. It's not preparing them to be an officer. And the answer that they give is, Professor Fleming doesn't understand because he's just into academics and we do the whole person. Well, I've been on the friggin' admissions board. I know what they're talking about with that. And they don't actually do the, full, the, the whole person. If you're a recruited 
we, it's true. The computer spits out a number that's called the whole person multiple. In the old days, it was the whole man multiple. And it's a computer generated thing where you get so and so many points for, you know, your grade point average. You get so and so many points for having been in student government. And you get so and so many points for being the captain of the football team, fewer points for being on the football team and so on. And it generates a number. And there's supposed to be an absolute minimum of the number that we'll consider. But for recruited athletes, along with recruited, you know, racial categories, there's no bottom because we send them to a lot of listeners don't know that every service academy has a prep school. And our prep school, it used to be for prior, I mean, back in the day, like a hundred years ago, it was for prior enlisted. And that I totally, I love prior enlisted. I mean, they're adults. They've been around the uh, barn a couple times. They've gotten some of the piss and vinegar out. And they're, they're just more adults and they know why they're there. So we ought to have more prior enlisted, incidentally. But the prep schools used to be essentially just for prior enlisted. Now they're for athletic recruits. And they're, you know, the big guys are the tall guys, some girls as well. And there's no bottom. In other words, we have students there with, with uh, if this means anything to you, SAT scores in the three and four hundreds. Our minimum to get into Annapolis is supposed to be 600, which is still only the 75th percentile nationally. So we're not, our, our SAT scores, if we're still into those, uh, we do still require them, but basically they don't pay any attention to them for half the class, are lower than the University of Maryland's at College Park. So we're not smarter. I'm not the one who goes on about best and the brightest. If you want, if you just say, look, we want, we want warm bodies, uh, just take the first, you know, they let in about 1,300, 1,400 kids for a class of about 1,200. So take the first, first uh, 1,200 to 1,300, 1,400 that apply. But we go on about, you know, we're, we have high standards. We don't have high standards. And it kills me. I uh, know I'm not into just academics. Believe me, if you know, we had kids of stellar character, but unfortunately they're not, a lot of them are very sweet and a lot of them do have stellar character. Don't get me wrong. Our, our upper, upper levels are very impressive indeed. But then we have con- constant cheating scandals. We have constant, you know, alcohol uh, abuse. We have, you name it. Well, you've got suicide. I know that's been an issue among the brigade at different points through different parts of the years. Saving our service academies, my battle with and for the United States Naval Academy to make thinking officers. That is available now on Amazon.com. It should be available everywhere. It's, pre- it's published by uh, Post Hill Press, but it's distributed by Random House. So it should be in bookstores. It is in bookstores. Any online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Can I give you a PS for fixing the 40%? Of Absolutely. The, the advice to, to the superintendent. She's not... All, all, the superintendent of the Naval Academy is a retirement job. They all retire after this. They get another star. When I first came in, they had two stars now they have three stars that was incidentally as a result of our cheating scandal of the early 1990s you know that'll show them we'll uh we'll give the superintendent another star and uh that, he'll he'll fix things up of course it did absolutely nothing but the goal of any superintendent to come in is to go out in a cloud of glory of course that doesn't always happen we've had one superintendent who was yanked after a year Maybe two superintendents ago was involved in the so-called Fat Leonard scandal. We have problems with superintendents, but they do not want to rock the boat. So the superintendent is not going to do squat, not squat, except, you know, show up at parades and act nice and, you know, put on parties in Buchanan House, it's called. Congress needs to get involved. How likely is that? Congress is pretty dysfunctional these days, and I don't see them taking on the service academies. But to answer the question, really what we should do is sandhurstize them and get out of undergraduate education so that they're not living together for four years with no hand-holding, men and women mixed, and being micro-controlled and putting on parades. But... My example for how we could fix 40% immediately comes from uh, our neighbors in Canada. I have lectured at their service academy. It's an amalgamated service academy for all services, the Royal Military College, and they do things better. Uh, you know, we joke about Canadians are kinder and gentler. They're just less obsessed. There's no wall around it, for example. You can be any age that can hack the physical side of things. The women don't have to, you know... It, 
if you look at the women, they've got all their, either they cut their hair off or they stopped doing that. Initially, they cut the hair of all the girls and the girls said, wait, we want to keep our hair. And besides, female officers in the fleet have to learn to deal with longer hair, which is all true. So now they have buns, like they got a, you know, a tight bun. But the girls at, at uh, the women in Canada, they, you know, got a braid down their back. They look nice, but it's just you could they can marry. There's no controlling of sex. So those things could be done overnight. We could also change the legal, their legal status. Now they're in the Navy, which means that they can be controlled by the UCMJ. We can change that status overnight and make them ROTC students. In fact, one, one idea I had for a while was to make uh, Annapolis ROTC Central, where, you know, kids go into to, uh, Texas A&M, they'll take a year at Annapolis and, you know, kids from wherever. My younger son goes to Tulane, they've got Navy ROTC, you do your, you know, like a junior year abroad, only a junior year at, uh, at Annapolis. Annapolis. It's one possibility, but they're paradoxical because they've been forced to open up to the civilian world, but they don't really want to do it. So the pot boils more and more vociferously more and more energetically. And the way that, that the administration deals with that is to press the top on ever more fir- firmly. I think they're going to explode. I mean, I, I, just don't, I just don't see it. You know, this blows my mind that I, as the one thing I'm getting at as we come out of this is that you know, as, as far as solving some of the problems that with the elimination of the undergraduate program, in an eight, adding an eight-month indoctrination training type of a program, we can have very similar results as what we're having right now. That's absolutely right. And we can use the buildings. And Annapolitans don't have to get their knickers in a twist about, except they won't have their football games. That's true. But yeah, Do you have any um, book signings or anything planned or that you're aware of? At this point, as your publicist, <laughs> right now what I'm doing is is a lot of what we're doing right here, right now. This morning, for example, I had a radio show. I've had uh, national podcasts. I've been on a mostly it's virtual. It came out last week, and I've been booked pretty solid every day, multiple multiple interviews. So that's that's where my energy is going these days. Fantastic. Well, everybody should have an interest in this that is listening because we are here. Focused on Anne Arundel County and, you know, whether you're in Glen Burnie or South County, but specifically Annapolis, I mean, the Naval Academy is such a huge part of our lives, whether it is disrupting traffic for the president that's coming to speak, whether it's the parades, whether it's the midshipmen that are out and about, whether it is the football games. The Naval Academy is intrinsic to Annapolis, and everybody should take an interest in this. You want to go to Amazon or look in your local bookstore at Saving Our Service Academies, My Battle With and For the United States Naval Academy to Make Thinking Officers. Professor Bruce Fleming is the author of his gazillions books, but seven most recently. <laughs> and it's a very unique insight into what, well, it's, it's a peek behind the wall is what it, what it is. When we go up... King George Street or one of those George Streets. I mean, you've got that big 12-foot wall, and uh, this is a really good peek behind that wall to really see what's uh, what's going on and, you know, make your own decision here whether, you know, are we doing enough to put out good leaders or do we need saving? Thank you very much. As I say, it's military Disneyland, folks. You don't know what goes on when the, when the, when the gates close, but I'm, I'm trying to tell you because you're paying for it. This has been a bonus podcast from Ion Annapolis. Please visit us at ionannapolis.net. Follow us on Facebook at All Annapolis and on Twitter at Ion Annapolis. And if you haven't subscribed to the Daily News Brief podcast, go for it. And all of your local news will be delivered to your phone, tablet, or smart device by 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday. 